Hello and welcome everyone to the Capital Mind podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit capitalmind.in and if you'd like to invest with us, do visit capitalmindwealth.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Mind may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hi everyone. and welcome to episode 59 of the capital mind podcast in today's episode deepak looks at investing opportunities in what we all hope will be a much more normal or at the very least less dramatic year ahead deepak talks about the return of high volatility and its implications the world of high inflation high interest rates and adjusting to these new price levels local manufacturing and geopolitical risks and how that impacts your portfolio and finally the impact of ai since like many of you we're all super intrigued by chat gpt as well hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of the capital mind podcast we've just started 2023 and if your your experience has been anything like mine you think the last 3 years have been well abnormal or unusual to say the very least So now as we settle into a new year um, I think everyone at Capital Mind is wondering what should we do with our money I mean given the tumultuous few years we've had and given that we thought we'd bring in Deepak and so welcome Deepak and here's our opening question to you it's 2023 uh, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened behind us how should we now invest in 2023 and what random predictions do you have for the year ahead which will obviously not be true but we should have this discussion anyway indeed indeed and welcome sir i think this is a uh, uh, you know a crazy year to predict because if you had asked me the same thing in the beginning of 2022 i wouldn't have told you that you know ukraine war and none of those things could have ever you know thought thought process if you had asked me in the beginning of 2020 maybe jan 1st i had heard of covid i had no idea it will change the world in the next 6 months perhaps some parts of life are easy to predict but some parts are in so incredibly difficult that all you can predict that is that there is going to be some change not that what that change will actually be so i want to paint this with broad strokes because you know that's all i have anything more narrow than the broad strokes that i have is probably most likely going to be wrong so uh, take all the predictions with a bunch of salt but i look at this as a learning curve from 2022 and i say okay the is 2023 and the decade that comes going to be vastly different from 2022 and the decade that was and the answer seems to be yes in at least four different areas that i have seen and these four different areas according to me bring about four specific aspects which we haven't seen in the last 10 years but possibly you know things like this existed in the past we just didn't pay too much information to it, uh, attention to it so if you look at 2022 and earlier what classified the last 10 years maybe for india a little bit but more for the world was there was not that much volatility in stock prices other than 2020 when everybody went you know that thing came back very fast so it almost made us forget about volatility but the same concept supplied the concept was increase availability of money reduce interest rates keep interest rates so low that you actually want to stoke inflation inflation is basically the rise of prices which is in a way a volatility of prices on the upside there was no rise in prices there was only a constant you know uh, e- equalization of prices throughout so to a large extent a millionaire in 2012 a millionaire in 2002 millionaire in 1992 you're roughly getting to be the same in if you're a millionaire in dollar terms but a millionaire in rupee terms is a very different person 10 lakh rupees was a huge amount of money in 1982 probably a little bit lesser in 92 much lesser in 2000 to and in 2022 it's probably the starting salary of a graduate now that that you know for an annual basis so it's almost like we and in india have seen volatility but the world has not the world has continued to retain its own tempo that's because low inflation existed volatility changes and what i think 
changes in the volatility game and we'll come to that over a period of time maybe we can take these each each of them at at a different point the point that it changes for us is volatility changes one specific aspect of the markets and when we talk about the markets you know it's both financial markets and perhaps real markets as well volatility increases the expectation of stock price movements and that is embedded in the options world right so india has seen this massive change where people trade less in stocks but more in options so the markets that who are driven largely by stocks are now driven by futures and options and mostly with the options crowd and the options crowd has uh, seen something called a vix the vix is a volatility index the vix was high in 2020 it was high before that maybe in 2013 but between that those times it's been abnormally low it spikes at certain times like results and elections and budget and so on but you know tends to be low and right now it's at the lowest it has should have ever have been given all the other circumstances around us we have high inflation high interest rates and so on why should this affect anything now one of the things that i feel um, is a problem here is that these option trading concepts that have happened over the last few have not taken into account the fear of high volatility that can come in why i say that is this if you go into any morning and write options both call options and put options on an index you tend to walk away towards the end of the day with some profit concept of this profit has largely come because volatility has been low so markets don't necessarily give you uh, a big move in either direction and that big move in either lack of a big move in either direction makes those options profitable to sell and a lot of retail investors have been selling options this change in option volatility if i if i were to put it another way i think that that's something that's going to change the core nature of how people participate in markets one of the reasons why so many people have incre- increased their participation in accounts and i was talking to the about this with anup uh, you know and uh, who's who's oh, you know who's probably not looking at the futures and options market so much because he's running momentum which largely a stock option right and he's been looking at the volumes in the markets we did a quick summary we said okay what are the volumes today in the markets this is jan first week there's roughly 35 to 40000 crores what was it in 2020 before the markets went up that's you know you would have expected the markets are up 50% so then it should have been 20000 crores now it's 30 30, 30 maybe 25000 crores but even then it was 35000 crores that means people are trading lesser quantities of the same stocks because the stocks have gone up in price so wh- where is all this new money that seems to be coming into markets new record 3x change in dmat accounts ye wo that's not actually happening in the stock markets those are volumes that have gone into the option markets and the option markets have been making people money because of the lack of volatility what i think 2023 will bring in is the return of it and that return has already happened in say the us where you've seen tremendous increases in volatility with the stock market down in fact if you look at the daily markets the us is very likely to be a 2% up 3% down kind of market and india is more likely to be a 0.3% up 0.3% down market right it's just so it's just, it's like so incongruent because india was this emerging market now the us is you know so it seems to me that that's actually the one of the changes that i think we're going to expect in the next 10 years is okay the us market may continue to be volatile but india will definitely be volatile at some point whether that happens exactly in 2023 or 2024 i don't know but i know that volatility is coming back it always does and i hate to say this but it only seems to come and hurt people when the option selling madness is at its peak the last time we saw this was 2011 before that it was 2007 and 2008 and that was i mean it was not as mad it is at as it is today but at that time it was institutional they were they were companies that were selling services large names i mean i won't name the names but there were large houses that were selling uh, strategies to people saying we will write options and we will do all this stuff and i know people who've lost money in them some of them compensated some of them had to take the hit 
this is now embodied. So, for instance, there is a famous fund house. It's uh, it's not in a fund house. It's an advisory company. It's listed. I won't name it. But they have managed to issue market-linked debentures. These market-linked debentures largely take exposure into nifty options. This book has reached 7,700 crores. In, which is a fairly large number you would imagine because such things were counted in the tens of crores earlier. You got one product that has 7,000 odd crores in uh, this options exposure. It may not be just that one company, it may be a bunch of companies. But they're all market link debentures uh, betting on the fact that the Nifty, if it goes up, I want a certain return which is linked to the Nifty. But when it goes down, it shouldn't make me lose money. So it's like, give me the upside, but not the downside. It's possible to do through options. And options have been available and priced and, you know, available at these prices because they were, uh, they're, they're mechanisms that allow people to um, use them for this purpose. What happens when this volatility spikes is that a lot of people who have bought such products tend to find that the fear of actually losing money uh, and and being protected it, it may not actually come about in in a lot of cases what happens is you may invest for a year the market doesn't do what you what it's supposed to do you might end up with just about the same money as you had one year ago so if you don't get any returns your first feeling is that i don't want to buy this product again that changes the characteristic of uh, a product so i think volatility coming back has uh, meaningful consequences for the option market and volatility coming back has a meaningful co meaningful um, uh, importance for people like us who are actually waiting for opportunities and when we're waiting for opportunities you need volatility you can't have one way rises you want people to panic a little so that when they sell in panic you want to be able to buy uh, you want even sudden moves to the upside because it gives you the, uh, you know, it it means that there is uh, activity that might actually benefit you in the longer term. It gives you chances to exit if if uh, there's enough volume that, you know, gives you an up, on the upside that allows you to exit as well. So volatility is actually our friend in the long term, but our enemy in the short term. So I think it's the return of it for the next decade. Does volatility only matter to options buyers and sellers, or do, I mean, does it do, as as say long term investors? It's just a positive, right? Or do we care? It's positive if you look at it longer term because it'll feel like this. I'll give you an example. Let's say a stock. There's a stock that comes out with this thing that says, you know what? We haven't earned as much as we used to last quarter last year. And in a market that is on steroids, they look at this and saying, it's the end of the story, it's finished, it's gone. They drag the price down, they sell, they sell, they sell, their reports that come in. And then the company is like, listen, it's the same company, we just didn't grow as fast as we did last quarter. But fine, you guys are going to bring the stock market price down, I don't care. Eventually, these some price at some price, there's opportunity. And that opportunity is coming because there's some other person who is simply not... Uh, either capable of holding or uh, somehow he feels that this is not you know this is not great so this feeling that it's the end of the story is always a great time to consider any sector or thought or something like that for instance we said if electric vehicle comes it will be the end of petrol and diesel cars but that that may be true in the long term but in the short term it may not be in the sense in the next 5 or 6 years Petrol and diesel are still going to be considerable forces in the cycle, in India at least, because we don't, I mean, even now people struggle to find electric, uh, you know, points to recharge their cars when they travel, simply because there are not enough of them. At some point, these people will get frustrated and say, electric is going to be my second car, and then my petrol and diesel is going to be my primary car. So there's, there's going to be opportunity where people think there is no opportunity left. Uh that is, the, and, and in volatile times, in non-volatile times, what happens is people have been flush with money in the last 10 years. That flush with money allows people to curb that volatility and say, listen, I have enough money and you know what, the stock has dropped a little bit, why don't I buy it? So when the stock drops a little, you find the buyer. Now, the buyers are like, they're hard pressed for money because money has become more expensive. So the stocks drop a lot more. This hasn't yet happened in India. It's happening more in the US. But at this, I mean, Tesla is down, what, 40% for the month or something, something like that for the month of December. And yet, 
the answer seems to be drop 12% on one single day because the number of cars it sold were 405000 in the quarter compared to 420000 that were expected now i'm like that does not sound so meaningfully different compared to what perhaps it should be and of course this is still valued at 38 times earnings nestle is valued at 80 times earnings yeah. in india so this is still a big difference but it's it's still valued at 38 times earnings but the the feeling that tesla is over and finished is out there right now and it's strongly out there and so any news that's even slightly contrary to what and by the way this 12 percent fall is after the 40 percent fall in december so it happened in january uh, so i think this return of volatility presents challenges presents op opportunities at some point if tesla's shares have fallen too much and a person like Elon Musk may have taken a loan against his holding in Tesla. Mm -hmm. The people who have given him that loan might have to take that share and forced sell them in order to recover their money because there's not a lot of collateral out there. What if they do that? Then there is going to be forced selling in Tesla also, at which point the price can become even more attractive. So you're, you and I are sitting over here saying, oh, well, it's fallen so much. It could be a buying opportunity. There's somebody out there saying, listen, I need to sell before it falls even more. And if that happens, volatility, that that comes back to you as a beast. So it's both a boon and a bane. So if we buy it and we lose 12% of our money, you know, just because of this forced selling or something, or 15% of our money, we will feel miserable in the short term. But perhaps if the company is sound and it seems to be for the most part, there is a good chance that you recover part of this, you know, uh, thing in the long term. And in that long term, uh, you might look back and say, I don't know what I was thinking. So that's the problem with volatility, really. Your second big point on non things for the is the return of inflation and the return of high interest rates. But at some level, I feel in India that by and large, I've, this isn't that much of a return. I mean, I, I've always experienced that these were reasonably high. But what do you have to say about this one in more detail? So I think here is where this, this becomes interesting because... It's not our inflation that seems to be a problem. The problem seems to be the inflation anywhere else in the world. So right now, India's inflation is sitting at roughly 5.8%. But America is sitting at 7%. Even a country like Germany is seeing 10% inflation. And uh, the UK is seeing even higher than 10%. Italy is seeing 11%. So you're seeing these, these countries, which are relatively large economies, seeing much higher rates of inflation than India. They haven't been able to handle it. And I'll tell you what the concept is, you know. So if you look at a central bank and he's saying, listen, there's too much inflation, they know only one way to solve this. Because when there was too little inflation, they dropped interest rates. When there's too much inflation, they will raise interest rates. Raising interest rates is a little bit like saying, I want you to spend less. And I'm going to make money more expensive. But by making more expensive, it doesn't mean that you have less money. It's more likely that your employer, the company you're employed with, has so little money and cannot borrow money that it will go bankrupt. When it goes bankrupt, it will fire you. You won't even have an income. Then how am I going to, how are you going to spend? So the way that it works is it engineers a recession. Now, when people borrow and they can't return money, the default and so it's a very bit of a it's, a it's a it's a it's a very struggling process in this case the last time this happened it was because of an extraneous factor like a lehman crashing and all this so it wasn't inflation that drove it but it was over leveraging by a certain set of it now what they're saying is if you haven't over leveraged i'll make the cost of money so expensive that even your normal leverage will seem like over leverage i'll give you an example for instance you buy a house and it's a I don't know, a million dollar house uh, uh, in the US. In million dollar house, US is like a one BHK in some cities. You know, it's that bad. So it's a million dollar house at a 3% interest rate, uh, fixed rate of interest is uh, possibly, I don't know, maybe $1,000 a month. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure what the numbers are. No, maybe more than $1,000 a month, but maybe two or $3,000 a month uh, for as, a, as your mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. Say $3,000. Let's give it an example of $3,000. Sure. Now, if you do double this interest rate, which is what it is, it's about 6.5% right now. So if you get a new mortgage for a million dollar home, you're going to pay maybe $5,000. So now, the guy who has the million dollar house is thinking, dude, I can't sell my house. 
I mean, sorry, I can't, uh, I can't sell my house and buy another house because even if I bought another house worth a million, I'm going to pay five thousand dollars a month instead of three thousand dollars a month for exactly the same house. So I can't upgrade my house. I can't even go to another house in the same locality. I will just stay in the same house. That house then, you know, does is not going to be sold, which means another new bigger house that. Uh, would have otherwise come into the you know be bought by the market will not get purchased uh, at the same price the only way a guy will upgrade is if he gets a better house at a lower price but that could happen because somebody gets desperate enough to sell they'll say well how can i bring this house to a point where if i sell it somebody else will buy this mortgage at a lower price the answer is it'll take a lot of time it takes a lot of time where this person has to get bankrupt only then will be able to be uh, wanting to sell the house maybe the house is foreclosed it's sold and so on so you end up with a situation where if you continue to own that house or you can want to upgrade the house or you want to buy a new house the cost to you is so much that you can't afford you can't afford it you can't afford to buy the house and so on what this does if eventually effectively is increase rents because uh, people when they can't buy houses they rent if they rent they they'll pay a higher rent because the cost of buying a new house is still higher it is when there are desperate sales that happen that prices start to come down people start to look at this and saying oh listen if that million dollar house is now $750000 my monthly payment will go to 3000 which is what i can afford so i will buy it that means somebody takes a 25% hit on that house the person who's selling it and uh, obviously the person who's buying it gets a uh, the same house at a lower price now until this sequence happens inflation is going to remain high and because the west hasn't seen it it's it, the feedback loop is a much longer loop uh, in india things change in different perspectives so for instance if something is not selling in real estate people hold it hold it for much longer people may sell it at a lower price and we saw the example recently of uh, uh, you know sonam kapoor apparently bought a property for 32 crores in 2017 sold it for 32 crores in 2022 which is or 2023 ndtv told me today yeah well, i see that you know you are, so you have this situation where about 5 and 1/2 years you had no returns on some of the really highest uh, price real estate in the country but there are some other pockets where things would have been quite different so i think dealing with this inflationary aspect and how it manages prices uh, of everything including stocks so why is stocks interesting now i am t- i can tell you this a lot of people tell me that listen if i get 8% i am okay 8% is much higher than the inflation that at least people in the higher income categories face so this 8% inflation per year i'll and give you an example of why we don't realize this but petrol prices haven't moved in the last one year finally <laughs> uh yes so it means you have 0% inflation in petrol that means on a year on year basis you are actually paying the same for petrol that you were as as much as you were last year i, I think roughly uh, that's 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 correct so people who are in the very low income brackets may not have their own vehicles therefore they may be using public transport where again there's been no inflation in the last one year but if you're using uh, your own vehicle the cost of petrol has not increased for you in the last one year which means there isn't that inflation that affects your life so if you get something worth 8% and your actual spending inflation is only 5% you're actually getting a real return of 3% that's all you want effectively and you might just say if i get that much why should i put so much money into equity why don't i put more money into debt or fixed income or whatever it is especially if the government is almost guaranteeing this 8% currently 10 year government debt rates at 7.3% which is close enough to 8% for it to be a difference and if you look at some state government debt 10 year state government debt which is again Sort of pristine debt in India, it's about seven point six, seven point seven percent. So you're at at a rate where it's actually uh, meaningful to not invest in equities, and instead invest in um, uh, fixed income. And some people will make that choice. When they do make that choice, they might either take out money from equities and then put it there. or they might actually say every incremental amount of money i get most of it goes into fixed income only a little bit of it goes to equities this just this change 
can rework equity markets and increase volatility in equity markets simply because you don't have the same participation as earlier. That I think that is where um, uh, inflation then of course begets volatility, but also inflation is creating that higher interest rate in environment where you know people move out of equity based risk securities over time move to uh, smaller. And this is not just us. I'll give you an example of a pension fund. A pension fund was told that you have $100, million, $100 billion in assets. But you know what? Your people are retiring at a point where you have to pay them, maybe now or in the future, $8 billion per year. Now you're thinking, if I get 8%, I'm done. Or if I get 6%, I'm done. You know, that's, that's the number that you might want to be targeting. Let's say the number was 6%. Before uh, this, in 2022 January, you were getting 0.5% to 1% on long-term U.S. government securities. So you're saying, listen, if I put it in long-term U.S. securities, I will get a billion dollars a year. That's not enough. I need to get at least 6 or $7 billion a year. How do I get it? I take maybe $60 billion and put it into U.S. securities, uh, you know, uh, government securities. But the remaining 40 I put into emerging markets, and hedge funds and venture funds and startups and all that stuff. The minute I start moving to uh, a point where in the US you get a mortgage-based security, the mortgage-based securities are now paying out around 6% a year. You're saying, dude, mortgage-based securities are paying 6% a year. I'm happy this is a collateralized thing. I can, I'm willing to take that risk that, uh, you know, mortgage uh, mortgages don't default. So why don't I, instead of going and buying equities and all that stuff, just dump more money into such things? What was 3% has become 6% and that 6% has become attractive to someone who wanted 6%. That means that money doesn't go to equities, doesn't go to hedge funds, doesn't go to startups. When you change this, what happens then to that equity world and the startup world and all that stuff is that money becomes way more expensive uh, for them. And they inherently have been very benign. Everybody has been like, listen, if I spend another $100 million, I'll get more market share. But now you don't get the $100 million. And then there's no game, there's no plan B. There's no plan B of saying, listen, what if I don't have $100 million? In India, we've actually kind of, I mean, not the startup world, but in general, our companies have changed track. Our companies have become less levered because they've seen high interest rates in the past and how it's affected them. So they've paid back some of their debt. Corporate credit has not increased meaningfully since, I don't know, 2013, 2015, actually. And you've got a point where um, the companies themselves are saying, listen, if this debt is a problem, it's not a problem for us. So the opportunities start to start to appear. And we'll talk about them more in detail. But I think inflation presents both opportunities and threats. The West will have less to deal with them. The next year is going to show us exactly how they're going to deal with it. They haven't faced long periods of sustained inflation. We are going to pass through this, you know, next uh, six months or next one year of, you know, traversing a territory where for them, everything is new and for India, not everything is new. I mean, so in that context, uh, a lot of fun. A lot of fun will be had, I think, uh, just watching this. And I don't say this in a entertainment kind of fun way, but I think more like interesting kind of fun way. You will find opportunities, you will find panic, um, and you will also find that certain companies go bust and it's perfectly fine if they do. I, I do think that the the investing set is not just equities, I think, as I remember. So now that, that definitely is going to be interesting. Your third point, which you had mentioned, and that's also going to come out in the article, I think, you're, which will probably even come out even before this podcast is published, um, is, your, is a slightly larger point around geopolitical risk and uh, local manufacturing. Intuitively, this makes sense, but could you talk about it a bit more? Yeah, so, you know, this is a weird thing that has happened. I think COVID has... Um, started kickstart this process and now it's more evident than ever before you, we have to de-optimize the world and this is not because we have to but because uh, the world wants to de-optimize itself simply because of the large amount of dependencies we're seeing almost in every part of the world i'll give you the example of how maybe one example of how it starts china is the world's you know manufacturer that means anything that has to be manufactured, some part or the other of it comes from China in some meaningful way. And 
uh, whether it is you know i don't know staircase hand door handles or whatever it is there is these things are manufactured in mass in china china decided i mean and the reason people did this was because it was cheap because you could import from china in a very cheap way and uh, take a door frame that is manufactured in china put it yourself and then call it an ikea door frame and it would be perfectly you know, for, uh, i i don't know i'm not I'm using the word ikea but i don't know if they import from china but i am assuming that at some point people imported from other countries that were low cost now a lot of this low cost came from china and in covid china decided that they were going to shut their borders when they shut their borders this whole ports got stuck uh, ships got stuck in ports uh, because they got stuck in ports the rest of the system which was oil like it's going to leave china today tomorrow morning it's going to be here and here it's going to offload 100 containers and take another uh, 200 containers and move on to the next one suddenly the ship hasn't arrived you're waiting for the 100 uh, containers to arrive but you're also waiting for 200 containers to get on and they're not getting on the ports are getting piled on with traffic and the person that's in turkey sitting and expecting something from i don't know malaysia is saying listen malaysia you're not in trouble why aren't you sending me the containers dude that ship hasn't come from china to send me send you the containers in the first place and you're saying oh, oh okay 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 this china problem has affected me in a way that I, when i wasn't even exposed to china what's the solution the solution seems to be let's build a little more buffers instead of me saying i'm going to need 100 parts and order them from china just about when i need them why don't i keep thousand parts with me available i'll build inventory buffers that that makes me available so if there's a problem a 10 day buffer time that i have I mean, earlier i have a one maybe a 10 hour buffer time now i have a 10 day buffer time for that i increase the inventories in my more than inventories instead of me holding the inventories in my factory i contact a local manufacturer and he says listen uh, i can't manufacture as cheap as china but You know what? I'll do the same thing for you, but I'll do it locally, so you don't have these shipping challenges. The guy says, "You know what? The shipping challenges are costing me, I don't know, two hundred thousand dollars a day, um, and that translates to maybe five dollars per piece of whatever I was manufacturing. If this guy's price is greater by one dollar a piece, I'm still okay because these co- these costs are actually meaningfully problematic for me in the future. Plus, China, even after COVID is over, continues to have a zero COVID policy for the longest time, and everybody else is partying and having fun and." China is locked in and shooting people if they get out of their houses. And you're thinking, dude, if you guys don't open the ports, I am screwed because my demand is back. Your demand, I don't know, I don't care about your demand, but I need you guys to start shipping me stuff. So, if the world goes more local, and almost everybody is, there's going to be a lot of interesting things that happen. There's going to be return of tariffs. the reason for that is because if China were to come back and China still starts offering things very cheap, China still becomes the de facto place for people to get stuff from but governments don't want this governments are like did you guys screwed our economy the last time we shut down you can shut down any time you want and i don't want to have that trouble again so guess what you import from china you pay a 20% duty that 20% duty makes items 20% more expensive to import from china so the local manufacturer says you know what i 10% more expensive than china now i'll be 10% cheaper because china is 20% more expensive so what happens now is that you go to the local manufacturer even though is more expensive because you made china more expensive inflation's coming as part of this because you made china more expensive items have become more expensive but you actually deoptimized and made yourself a little more self reliant the return of local manufacturing and you know this has a complicated thing with geopolitical risk so for instance right now you import from abroad because there's a seamless process of everything suddenly uh, maybe your factory in china uses some kind of artificial intelligence based technology to manufacture whatever it is you want to manufacture the us has decided that china should not get access to certain kinds of chips or certain kind of technology that has that allows them to manufacture a certain kind of chip and that chip is the ai thing and then you're thinking you know what if the us doesn't like china why am i in india getting affected because all i need is this little device that's been manufactured but it needs that ai chip but they're not getting more of it because you know the us has banned uh, china from getting it and so this geopolitical risk is no longer just about you and another country it's you and it's any country in any other country because the supply chains are so you know convoluted and on top of that it may affect you for instance the us has decided to sequester russia's foreign reserves which means any 
country that thought it had dollars because they sit in dollar banks uh, and they could use them for anything they wanted suddenly can't, suddenly they may find that the us says no i'm sorry you you can't use these things for whatever you want because i don't like you the minute they start doing something like this you're thinking i don't want my money in those dollars anymore you want to deoptimize away from the dollar based trade system to say i will trade in a different set of currencies maybe the rupee maybe the renminbi maybe the uae dinar i don't know what it is but it's not going to be only uh, the american dollar this fear uh, psychosis is going to develop in the next it's already started so for instance china is asking the gcc countries the gulf countries to trade oil in shanghai on the exchange in renminbi in fact russia is telling india it wants to get paid either in rupees or in dinars ua dinars ua dinars can be exchanged for uh, renminbi on a cross exchange along with uh, shanghai so the idea being there is a three way between the ruble the shanghai din, uh, you know the the uh, chinese yuan and the ua dinar rupees no longer in this equation because we refuse to free the rupee so nobody cares but i think this part of this process is saying that listen none of these currencies involve the dollar this geopolitical risk is what's affecting you as well suddenly you need to change your contracts away from one currency which you're used to and to something else i think this is where our biggest concept of geopolitical risk comes in is we uh, and it's not just we it's almost every country is saying can we focus instead on local economies compared to whatever we're focusing on outside of our local economies uh, 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 and in india has a large local economy right so it for us it makes sense to both locally manufacture and focus on our own population larger than anything else so for instance we might say listen let's do local manufacturing uh, serve our own population so what does the government do the government print gives production linked incentives it doesn't give export linked incentives it just says produce here and i'll give you an incentive it's you make sense to produce a car here because you have x amount of duty 28% or something like that but if you bring in a car from outside there's 150 or 100 200% duty in effect so Indians pay a lot more for high end imported cars than almost any country in the world and the reason for that is the government is only saying listen if you send me a full car fully made car i will charge you through the roof make some part of it here and the more you make of it here the lesser duties you'll pay so effectively uh, every country starts to adopt this mechanism this changes the nature of everything that you uh, are investing in because you're thinking if a company has x amount of capacity and it can use 80% of it for india the remaining 20% can be used for exports but exports are not going to be that easy anymore so what will happen in the export regime is going to be that company is going to have to have balance sheet so if a, there's a tire manufacturer that's exporting he might say listen i'll manufacture i don't know 75% of the tire here and then the remaining 25% maybe it's you know belting the tire or you putting uh, certain activities that i would otherwise have done it in full and sent the full piece abroad earlier that last bit i will do in a localized setup in europe a localized setup in uh, turkey or germany or something like that the idea here is that you know it increases cost so for me the cost of export earlier was just to make something here and ship it out tomorrow the cost is going to be like i'm going to have to acquire a plant over there and i'm going to have to put uh, capacity to for that plant to be doing this last mile thing it's going to cost me a little more because that's why you know i i was manufacturing in india so you're going to see companies with larger balance sheets do much better and these larger balance sheets are going to help them draw money from the markets one of the core things that i'm afraid of and one of the maybe this is the exact opposite of being asset light your asset light because you want others to own the assets now the others can't afford to own those assets and they are very very inefficient when they own assets but you didn't care when the interest rates were low because you're like okay those inefficiencies don't matter but now those inefficiencies matter you want to own those assets you want to be able to build them you want to build you want to build balance sheet you want to borrow money to be able to get decent rois because otherwise raising money in equity is a waste of uh, then equity is costly so you end up with a situation where if you want this debt you're going to have to be profitable so it's the return of asset heavy and it's the return of profitable i think that is one of the key takeaways over here 
from an investing perspective because the guys who have balance sheet and who have uh, profitability probably are going to win the next 10 years that again seems to follow some sort of intuitive stuff that people have been saying i'll come to the one, slightly surprising one that you mentioned which is uh, ai and you use the example of those those chips which china needs for well you know, chat gpt has made has made this very interesting but do uh, uh, you believe that this is now the the finally that take off moment where things went because it also gets some questions remarkably wrong as well right it does in fact it's part of the process and the, what's what's happening right now is it's getting more mainstream so to that extent i think you might find that ai will write our next podcast it could very easily in fact already people are going to ai and saying can you please help summarize what capital mind send in this podcast and they coming out with some reasonably correct and some little bit wrong kind of things but you know you know that the thing is getting the gist of a lot of things so it's just going to take a few more cycles of improvement to get there i think here is where we should be we should be very inter- careful because in the last era we took away jobs which were boring or or repeatable so for instance if i had to lift a ton of bricks now i get a forklift and it lifts a ton of bricks i don't need a human being to be lifting bricks i earlier used to manufacture cement using some kind of a uh, hand mixer very very lightly automated thing now you have cement mixers that come with premixed concrete and premixed concrete can be poured directly so i don't need all the cement makers and the mixers and all of that stuff on site the minute i don't need this the next thing would be that the people who are usually doing this would be out of jobs but they upgraded because what happens was now instead of me getting one premixed concrete truck which is enough for one house i built 10 houses and i get 10 cement mixers and 10 cement mix premixed concrete uh, trucks require 10 premixed truck drivers and and a few other people and so on so the job shift AI, I think, is going to take over our jobs. I'm talking about ours means people who are creative and white collar, which means that, early, I mean, in the middle, of course, you had another era of white collar jobs like people who were transcribing stuff. Now you had a software that automated transcribing. You said I don't need so many people. Then you had people who were doing, you know, spreadsheets, just entering data into spreadsheets. Then you had visual recognition software that read through everything and then said, okay, dude, we'll we'll fill it automatically for you guys. You don't need humans. So the the even the white collar, the more repeatable tasks got automated out. And eventually, I think this is where the interesting part comes. Is now the creative people who are supposed to have these born talents, content. You write great content. So what? AI can write it. GPT is show chat GPT is showing us how to the extent where they're actually answering questions in meaningful ways, not just answering the question, but telling you various ways that it got to that answer. So it not only gives you the answer, but also makes you think. This is not something that you have earlier experience. Earlier, you ask a question, it gave you the answer, and then you said, okay, maybe this is right with a smart computer and all that. But now it's almost telling you, listen, this is how I got there. This is interesting. because now the content writers when they start giving abstract concepts to a chat gpt they get out content which is almost as good as having written it themselves and i have seen this uh, you know quite well so it's a, you could take this content massage it a little bit and then pass it off as your original content eventually they won't even need you because it will get so good at writing content by itself that and it's doing this with art building fantastic paintings that look so good that you couldn't uh, the digital painting is fantastic enough to be able to be hung as a frame in your house with a digital uh, whatever setup so the same thing you could apply to music there this digital generation of music once you feed enough music to it you get so much hidden uh, the the ai piece looks at it and says well, you know what humans seem to like this thing and this thing and this thing and if uh, i do very innovative mixes of these things maybe they like it and the chances are you might just find that the ai generates much more uh, quantity of really good music simply because it has figured out what we like Uh, i don't know how that process i mean i can't say that there's no rule saying oh oh we like high notes before we like no notes you know some they, i don't they, those are heuristics but i don't think you should think of life ai as heuristics ai is more a neural thing so it will eventually figure it out based on various states and when it does figure out this 
and it starts generating music of its own. What happens to all the musicians who, by the way, might look at the same music and say, damn, I can't produce this kind of music myself because this thing is just way more advanced than anything that I've ever built. Take the same thing on videos. Today we think of video content as generated. Tomorrow you'll have entirely AI generated actors that look human, that are generated in videos in environments that look actually real. They're making dialogues that have been generated through AI which sound like great dialogues. So, you know, darling, I don't give a damn, may not be a single piece that you have read in a book uh, 20 years ago. You might have hundreds of such dialogues that suddenly seem to come out of the ether. Literally, or well, not literally, but figuratively, because the the AI engine is generating these things because they know you like that kind of stuff. So the creative people are getting out of jobs. They're going to have to learn, like the cement mixer people became the cement mixer dry truck operators. They need to be the ones that figure out how to make this AI do what is really, really good. For a long, for the longest time in you know the world will kind of change this. But we, and you know what? I say this for the trading world. We run a PMS. We do a lot of data crunching. We do a little bit of subjective analysis of that data crunching. And then we say, okay, this is a great strategy to do. What's to say this cannot be done by a computer? It's already is in the Forex trading world. It's already is, it is done in the arbitrage world. What's to say it cannot be done for long-term fundamental-based investing as well, long-term quantitative investment of any meaningful sort as well. The discovery of what will work is about predicting how humans will react. And if the uh, prediction of humans, uh, how humans will react was largely a human process in the sense, I think this is a great stock and I think you think this is a great stock. And you will realize that this is a great stock, which is why I buy it. I don't buy it alone. I mean, you know, one of the things that Anup did as a research piece was about how many stocks went 10x in the last 10 years. The, out of the stocks that went 10x in the last 10 years, a hundred became a thousand, right? But out of that hundred becoming a thousand, how much was earnings growth responsible for that 900 rupee jump? The answer to that seemed to be about 220 rupees out of the 900 rupees came from earnings growth. The remaining came from the perception, the PE ratio. The perception of what is great went up simply because, I mean, went up, in the last 10 years and that's what caused the 10x return. If more of your return comes from what people's perception of your stock is rather than the earnings of the stock by itself, then over time, a greater predictor of earnings will come from the AI-based analysis of all the events gone by and an AI engine will probably say, listen, this is likely to be taken as a positive by the market and they might do investing better than us. I, I think, you know, it's a real thing We'll have to figure out where we stand in that equation. I think all of us have to figure out where we stand in the AI equation. But the next 10 years will be a very interesting entry point into uh, how AI is going to change our lives. So this, book, this was quite interesting, all these four big trends that you talked about. Maybe let's make it a little more tactical because at least one 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 other way to look at it is like, fine, these are the big big trends that we have coming up or, or big changes we have coming up. So let's take a more concrete example where let's say I through some either good fortune or great insight, made a bunch of money some point at some point of time over the last couple of years. And now, sensibly, I've still been sitting on it and I'm keeping it aside. And now I'm hoping that normalcy or the new normalcy has, has sort of returned and then you can make decisions. Um, what do I do with that money now? Uh, and we can frame this from an Indian point of view because that's where most of our listeners are, obviously. Yeah, so I think, you know, Shrey, I think the big problem in this entire equation is that... When the paradigm shifts, what do you shift into? The paradigm shifting is of inflation, of higher interest rates, of sustained inflation. What happens? And I add this to this local manufacturing thing. So you got high interest rates. You got uh, a move into localization of manufacturing. So the government wants to reduce the defense imports. Uh, other people want to re reduce chemical imports, something like that. You want to get into manufacturers locally who have the balance sheet and capacity to expand. I need the balance sheet because you're going to be able to take on debt to expand uh, because equity is going to be that much more expensive because it's not available. Every money everybody's money is moving to fixed income over time if you're able to get debt at a relatively cheap price who are the companies that will 
it will be companies who have reduced their debt in the last decade who will be able to expand their debt in the coming decade you've got opportunity because now there's there's duties that help protect you from imports there's also uh, so the fact that interest rates are high means the more profitable and the more um, uh, you know uh, ba- the better balance sheet you have the more easy it is to be for you to be able to raise debt to meet that opportunity that means you're going to be able to get leverage to help yourself feed into the opportunity that comes in this means you want to buy the local manufacturers the domestic uh, consumption of, i mean people who are targeting dom- d- d- domestic consumption i won't take sector names but i think over here anyone who has a good and solid balance sheet i, I, I won't say this is for people who have extremely leveraged balance sheets a lot of power producers for instance extremely highly leveraged balance sheets they can't borrow more very easily but uh, some other lots of other sectors including you know automotive parts manufacturers and a bunch of others they will actually be able to uh, manufacture or grow their businesses a lot more than say a tech company a tech company may not have any debt at all it's seeing sliding demand from say the us and the europe and all of the other markets and it cannot take debt to expand it doesn't probably need debt to expand capacity but even if it expands capacity there's not enough supply and demand I and mean, there's not enough demand to kind of uh, meet that expanded capacity whereas the local manufacturers so you want to focus on the infrastructure pieces you want to focus on the manufacturing pieces you want to focus maybe to a certain extent on certain types of construction as well but that becomes one big sector the other part is import substitution so if the government's scope of import substitution is is serious they're actually giving people rewards for this so that means not only do you want to have people produce stuff you want them to be part of this pli programs that the government does so that they get an extra profit by uh, manufacturing for local demand for over the next 10 years this is kind of interesting because i think uh, you look at infra china plus one import substitution defense uh, railways all of these are very interesting sectors to be in and to participate in the next big bull run uh, financials will be an interesting story uh, over time but financials i think will are, are going through a cycle they're going through an up cycle right now and possibly their down cycle comes before because at extremely high interest rates they tend to suffer much more than uh, the manufacturing sector and all because banks by definition are very highly levered and higher interest rates affect them a lot more so over time you know we i think we will be you know that's one layer another thing is what are we building this infrastructure for and uh, the answer to that seems to be you know make more stuff locally make, but then make more stuff locally and then transport them how oh by road by rail by port by airport if that's the way you're going to do this then why aren't we buying logistics companies aren't they the biggest players that are going to benefit from this because if you manufacture locally that means uh, you're going to have to transport stuff from place a to place b more capacity being built in india means more industrial uh, i mean uh, uh, commercial transfer of goods from one place to another no matter which sector it is so you got logistics companies who are relatively undervalued at valued at 12 10 to 12 or 13 times earnings all sub 30 20 20 30 000 crores in market cap and i think the whole sector itself deserves a much higher rating we were talking about fedex the other time i think fedex is valued at i think 35 40 billion just under 50 yeah 50 billion so um no, which is probably higher than all logistics companies in india added up and multiplied by 5 Uh, and fedex wasn't even the biggest one there was ups which was significantly larger yes and ups is more than 100 so you end up with a situation where i think logistics has a very large role to play so if you get logistics companies at the cheap that might be one of the sectors that you want to buy there's also uh the increased government expenditure 150000 crores a year on railways 150000 crores on uh, defense and stuff like that that's a fairly large revenue pool these companies in this space hl for instance has a 30% 20 25% uh, profit margin now if you're telling me that if i could take that company which makes a 25000 crore turnover today and make it 35000 crores just 10000 crores more out of incremental cap expense of another x so you will Uh, take that thirty five thousand crores, and you will actually add nearly I don't know three thousand crores as two thousand two thousand crores as a profit into this H L. Two thousand crores uh, currently uh, for for what it's worth, uh, I think there's about a four 
फोर्टीन टाइम्स अर्निंग इन एचल फोर्टीन टाइम्स अर्निंग वो ट्रांसलेट इन टू रफली वेल सिक्स थाउजेंड रोज ऑफ प्रॉफिट गिव और टेक सो इफ यू आर लुकिंग एट सिक्स थाउजेंड क्रोज ऑफ प्रॉफिट इन क्रिमिनल प्रॉफिट ऑफ अनादर टू और थ्री थाउजेंड क्रोर्स फॉर अ पब्लिक सेक्टर एंटिटी दैट्स लाइक अ थर्टी परसेंट ग्रोथ राइट देयर एंड पॉसिबली गोइंग टू ग्रो इवन हायर बिकॉज मोर एंड मोर इम्पोर्ट सब्सिट्यूशन विल कम सो यूर टॉकिंग अबाउट सम ऑफ दी सेक्टर्स वेर आई थिंक द द बेज विल एक्सपैंड क्वाइट सब्सटैंशली मच अबाउट दिस मे हैव ऑलरेडी हैपन इन टर्म्स ऑफ एक्सपेक्टेशन बट आई वुड से अपॉर्चुनिटीज विल कम बिकॉज दे विल बी पॉइंट्स ऑफ पैनिक वेर पीपल पैनिक सेल दी स्टॉक्स एंड सो ऑन ए आई इट सेल्फ ए आई आई थिंक देर नो अपॉर्चुनिटीज इन इंडिया राइट नाउ नॉट मेनी पीपल आर डूइंग एनी थिंग दे आर प्रॉब्लली वन और टू कंपनीज रिलायंस ओन अ बंच ऑफ कंपनीज दैट हैव सम ए आई केपेबिलिटीज बट अदरवाइज नॉट यू नो एंड देर आर ऑल वेरी स्मॉल राइट नाउ सो वी डोंट हैव एनी कैपेसिटी इन इंडिया सो दैट माइट बी द investable opportunity maybe in pri- the private space where india has some companies but i think there's a lot more things can be done where that can be done whether it is ai designing automated translation systems uh, that allow me to translate speech in one language instantly to any other language that allows no human requirement of translation so if i am talking in a language somebody wants to listen to this in gujarati that with maybe a couple of seconds lag uh, everything i say is being translated into gujarati uh, using ai uh, now who which company is doing this very few that are in the listed space so i think this is where the the capacity i mean the, the opportunity is not yet known but this is a huge opportunity outside india we'll come to that in as as that uh, comes in so just i mean just thinking one thing the opportunities exist but on the timing front because in the example i gave you are already sitting on this pile of money i think i'll just go back to your original point that in a world with high volatility either you do sips because that's how you like to do things anyway and you don't want to have to think about it or you wait for the volatility to work in your favor and that's when you pile in is that fair yes i think you know panics and uh, manias are part of we've seen the mania we haven't really seen panic in the last two years uh, ever since uh, the march 2020 uh, march 2020 so i think the panics will come and earlier panics were s- uh, smoothened out by money you had too much money available that money was flowing into equity the minute anything was looking to fall someone else would come and protect that we've seen in the last how one year how that has not happened in certain say startup ipos in india startup ipos in the us much of the us market tesla is down 70% so all of this stuff means that equity money is not coming as easily to protect downfalls there is no predefined put option that has been sold by anybody uh, like the fed and so on so there's no free money coming in anymore that means panics will increase as panics increase you're going to find that some opportunities come where either the whole market collapses or certain stocks do and those uh, stocks may have been on your radar earlier saying i love this stock but i don't want to buy it at this price this becomes much easier for you to kind of plonk in money when it falls knowing that even after you plonk in money there could be another panic fall because there's so much force selling that happens this force sellings uh, can can actually mean that somebody has to sell even if they don't want to sell for instance if there's a mutual fund or a pms that has a very large position in a certain stock and there's a lot of redemptions from that mutual fund or pms that pms has no other option but to sell the stock or the mutual fund does and they will sell it regardless of the price they'll be like listen i have to give my customer his money back or her money back and i'm uh, i have to sell i just it is just part of what i have to do so the minute this forced selling comes in this forced selling can come for multiple reasons it can come because an index decided to rebalance your stock and we did this little bit business on our youtube video uh, earlier which is that you know sometimes uh, promoters pledge their stock they have to sell it. like i talked about in tesla they they may be forced selling over there uh, they may be forced selling in india it's happened in z for instance where the promoter sold and you know those shares came in so a lot of such forced selling may produce opportunities and those opportunities may be um, available for people who have the money so if you're in sip mode and i think you should be because for the most part you know tracking these opportunities and figuring out when the investable time frame is almost a full time activity i would say don't time it do sip if you don't have the time to look at the market but if you do there will be opportunities in 2023 and those opportunities are what you should grab and assume that no matter when you put in money there will be another 30% drop on top of it 
I, I know it hurts, but that was going to be my question because the moment you feel it's fallen enough, it can still the falling is unlimited. I mean, yeah, it's... yeah. I mean, uh, Tesla's you know twelve percent fall we talk about is actually if it's fallen forty percent from the top and then fallen another twelve percent. Uh, if you put a hundred dollars in, it first became sixty, and then it fell to fifty four again. So you know you, you no matter. So the way that you look at things is the fall the stock that falls ninety percent. Is first a stock that falls eighty percent, and then falls by half. So uh, you know you can lose half from anywhere. Yeah. I'll I'll come to my last point for the, today's conversation, which is that there's one thesis that's been going around, which is that for a decade, uh, on the back of this easy money and and policies of the sort, the United States and and in general U.S. tech tech companies have just left everyone else I mean far far behind, and they've grown a lot. And maybe now is the time for mean reversion, and things like emerging markets can get their mojo back, and so on. Uh, and India, at least, certainly seems like a reasonably attractive place at the moment. So, do you believe in this thesis that uh, this is the time for emerging markets to to shine per se, and this is this is our moment, and the US will probably relatively underperform? I mean, in general, I would agree with that statement because hey, I live here, and, <laughs> you know, things are biased and all that stuff. But I think I have a problem in one area: in innovation, in research. And in hardcore technology, I think great. We're great for infrastructure. We're great for building manufacturing capacity and all of that stuff. But the thing is, what do you manufacture? We don't make our own ultrasound machines. Uh, for the most part, these are made by like Siemens and G and Samsung and to a smaller quantity, Philips and all that stuff. So, they, wh- wh- India has the most population in the world. We should have the maximum demand for ultrasound machines, and yet we don't make them here. We don't make dentist chairs in India. Uh, why I don't know. They, don't don't we all have teeth? And there are hundreds of we go everywhere. There's a dentist. Uh, those chairs are being imported from Germany and from this and from that and all that stuff. I think, in terms of research, uh, the opportunities lie elsewhere. And like you were saying, the vaccines that we had, we we did the fantastic delivery mechanism for vaccines all over the world. We didn't make the vaccines, uh, or maybe one we did, but most of them came from abroad and. That became the problem because uh, this the research for these vaccines aren't as much in India as they are, uh, you know, abroad. So we're we're in the nascency of this uh, tech, uh, biotech, uh, core tech, AI tech, any tech kind of mechanism, and that is one of the reasons why I think you will have to look outside of the emerging market universe. And you'll have to look at companies, even in Israel, uh, which is an emerging market, but has a high uh, technology and research uh, kind of coefficient. And you also have, uh, um, uh, you know, so we have companies that that do a lot of research, but they're not very well listed. And to a very large extent, we will wait for some technologies to, you know, build themselves and cement themselves abroad before we get in. AI, there's nothing happening in most public companies in India. So I would say if you want to play the AI world, you will not play India. You're going to take the money outside and buy the US stocks or companies in that space who are listed in the US. If you want to play cannabis, for instance, which may be actually a big theme in the next 10 years, that theme uh, is not available in India to play. A, it's not legal and B, uh, none of the uh, uh, companies, I mean, no, nobody even thinks about it as an investable thing in India. Biotech, pharma, a lot of the spaces simply don't have large equivalents of large profit, uh, you know, pools in India. So I think all of these for these sectors, you're going to want to go outside of India. There is a very good opportunity now in the next six months as well, where or next year as well, where you've got this situation where the you those markets are facing a lot more panic than we are. You have the ability to take out money from India and buy those units and stocks and so on. I don't say that you should put all your money outside India. I think India has a huge opportunity in rupee terms to make money. But it also means that you could put part of your money outside, especially where sectors uh, look very attractive. Unfortunately, as a PMS, we can't do any of this stuff. We can't invest outside. So I wish we got a proxy that allows us to do it. But I think outside of the pure tech world also, whether it is AI or biotech, or you know, the research in almost every other field, that will be give meaningful opportunities outside of India. And I think we should be open to that concept as well. All right, Deepak. So from the very top 10,000 feet, all the way to sectors and emerging markets versus uh, developed ones, 
thank you so much for this great conversation let's hope 2023 is a volatile but nonetheless normal and upward trending year i i, I love that in fact i think wish you a you and everyone you know who's listening a uh, happy prosperous new year uh the prosperity may happen over the next decade but this is the time to start getting prosperous and always is every year is and i hope and i know that this is true that this will always be the first day of the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let it be the uh, happy rest of your life that's a good one thanks deepak <laughs> Well, thanks for listening. If you'd like to listen to more of our episodes, do visit capitalmind.in/podcast. And if you have ideas or feedback, then send them over to podcast at capitalmind.in. If you're looking for someone to manage your money for you, do visit capitalmindwealth.com to see if our portfolio management service is right for you. We have passive products at 0.25% per year and active strategies at 1% per year with no performance fee.